So now we turn to um, one more factory, this long uh, red striped building. And then we will be going into the Holy of Holies, into the actual uh, assembly hall here and the, uh, the, the actual tokamak facility. But first, I want you to take a look with me at the, at the magnets that we make here on site because they are simply too big to transport. Um, when, we, when we see uh, later inside the, the assembly hall and the tokamak building, you will see the first installed magnet, um, which is about 10 meters in diameter. And so at that, at that diameter, 30 feet in diameter, it was still uh, manageable to bring this after it arrived from China uh, in Marseille, it was still possible to bring it up the Eater Road, uh, just occasionally brushing the trees. In fact, um, about two years ago, when we saw this was going to happen, and they had actually decided they were going to ship it flat instead of shipping it at an angle, uh, we had to, uh, the local authorities uh, were gracious enough to uh, cut away some of the cliff so that that magnet would be able to pass. But if you go inside this building, you'll see that we, we have some magnets that are on the order of uh, 17 or 24 meters in diameter. And that's simply too big to actually ship up the roadway. So what you're seeing here is how these magnets are actually manufactured. So if you had if you ever had to make a, a motor or make a, a magnet winding in, in uh, high school physics, you would have used wire. This is our wire. This wire is um, solid enough that you, you know, if you have a good length of it, it makes for a nice bench press. It's, it's quite heavy. It's niobium uh, tin or niobium titanium, depending on uh, which magnet we're actually using, uh, we're actually making. There are two types of superconductor used. So it arrives at ITER in sort of a, a big round spool. This is an example uh, you can just see in the background here mm -hmm. of the, the spool of the magnet. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it arrives. That's how it's, it's manufactured and sent. So then it has to go through a series of machines that, that first of all, straighten it both uh, uh, up, down, and, and side to side, straighten it perfectly. And it's not easy to do. This is very, very thick, I would say. Uh, if I, I, if you can see me on the screen, here's, here's a, an example of a piece of that magnet. That, that is a cross section. So that, that's how thick the magnet is. It's not exactly wire when it comes to bending. But then it is uh, cleaned. And then there are machines that shape it going this direction and over here going this direction. So you see the wire at the back. It's actually a double, what we call a double pancake being made. It's laid down. Um, strip by strip in these spools. And it's a good illustration of, of multinational uh, inaccuracy in language. This looks nothing like a pancake to an American. Um, it is more of a bagel, if anything, but um, it, it is laid down in these, what they call flat pancakes. Mm -hmm. And along the way, it's been wrapped, the, the metal has been wrapped in an insulating material. So then um, what, you, what you're going to get if you go down from this station, to this, the next, you'll see here's another one that's being that's already been laid, wrapped in plastic until it gets used again. And you have a linear construction system all the way down the hall. So you go to the next station and uh, where, where we are just now, uh, and you'll see that, that as we progress, we go from uh, one magnet, uh, uh, or sorry, one, one uh, pancake to the point where now we have a, a series. Now what's happened in this case um, we've gone from this one pancake. Now this is a fully assembled uh, PF5, poloidal field, number, uh, poloidal field coil number five. So what does fully assembled mean? We have stacked a series of about eight of these uh, pancakes into a single magnet. We have um, uh, fused the ends together where, where one pancake ended and the other began, all the while ensuring that in the in the center of the magnet, so you have the you have the niobium tin with a copper embedding and a steel casing, but in the uh -huh. middle, this is where the actual liquid helium is going to be running at minus two hundred and sixty nine degrees to supercool the magnet. So that means that if you're joining these magnets one piece after another, um, one pancake after another, you have to ensure that the that the helium passage everything has to be absolutely perfectly aligned. 
for the superconducting to happen so you don't get arcs, um, for the helium passage to be there. And then we're adding the pieces that will both structurally support the magnet. Um, sorry, first there's another step where we, we um, embed it in, in resin. So we actually, we have a machine, a, a table that holds the whole thing and tilts it so that, so that the magnet, uh, so that the air bubbles will come out of the resin. So it's to give it structural stability because this magnet material, the, the, the superconductor we're using is a bit brittle. Uh, it, it could be broken if it's not fully supported. So that's why you have so much of it, why it is wrapped so securely. And then at the end, you're putting in all of these other pieces. So that allows you then, here is, here is uh, where, we're, where we're coming from, where we have the larger magnet. Now, this will allow us to take it to the next stage where um, you'll actually, I think, okay, so we're actually inside the magnet now in this, in this uh, photo. So by the human, you get an idea of how big this thing is, mm -hmm. right? And what you would have remaining in the, in the, overall, uh, in the overall tour now is if you, if you continued, is you would actually have a flat layer, what, what looks like a, it looks like it's more magnet, it's not. This is a curved, this is one half of a curved um, uh, cold test facility. So you pick the magnet up and you actually deposit it in here, put another circle on top, and then it looks like a giant worm or something. And then you can actually do cold testing to cryogenically verify that all the, all the magnet is working as it is supposed to before you take it out of the facility, um, where in that once we leave the facility, it will come out here and be trundled across either into temporary storage or going in the back of this cleaning building and into the assembly hall. So now yeah. we're going to go, now that's, we will go into that assembly hall, but that's the process of making a magnet. That's really, really, really fascinating. You know, so uh, we know that the liquid helium flowing, flowing through that little hole uh, at the center of the, uh, of the conductor, of the superconducting conductor, um, the, do you have an estimate of how much helium is required to cool down that massive amount of superconducting material after, after the entire magnet was built? And, and this whole structure has to be thermally sealed to make sure that, you know, you have a very low liquid helium boil off, right? Yeah, we don't plan to re, you know, we, we don't want to be replenishing the helium because it's just so, uh, so much, um, uh, so expensive and also so scarce. It's not something, as you know, anybody who's worked in a laboratory knows that helium, you know, we're not, we're not doing as much with helium balloons as we used to play with them when we were kids. Um, and here in the cryogenics facility that we, that we uh, visited just a few minutes ago, you have, um, this is where the actual uh, helium is, is taken uh, from gas and made liquid, but this is the overall amount that you're going to have. It will be 25,000 metric tons of, of uh, liquid helium. So wow. it is an amazing amount that is circulating in here. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, in, in, in the United States, the price of liquid helium is roughly $10 a liter. So Something like that. 25,000 metric ton, that 25 million, kilogram which is roughly 25 million liter and if you and I, I suppose it's much more expensive in uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world because US has a massive you know, liquid helium reservoir yeah. so we're talking about 250 million dollars just of liquid helium yeah and that's why that's why you don't that's why this is well that is one reason that the system has to be airtight because you don't want to waste the helium the other one is that you have to the reason it has to be so absolutely tight is because the magnets themselves, uh, you want no breaches. You, you do not want to, um, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's a system of continuous circulation, yeah. So let's go in the assembly hall now. Um, that's the big building here that, that, that is, uh, we're gonna go, well, the, the magnet would come out of the building we were just in and go into this cleaning facility because this is all now operating as a, as a complete uh, clean room. So inside the assembly hall, what you've got is, is the ability to put all of these giant components together. So the overhead cranes that you're seeing here, each pair can hold about 750 uh, tons. Um, so in combination, 1,500, 1, the heaviest load for each 
uh, was actually the first component installed in the tokamak, which was about 1,250 uh, tons. That was the, the base, the first part of the cryostat that we were talking about uh, earlier. And I will show you that uh, installed in a bit. But the components come in here in the back after they leave the cleaning facility. And then they are uh, hoisted with not only a lot of strength, but incredible precision that these, that these cranes can use. So that's one tool. The, the next tool, which I'll show you on another picture as well, you have two standing behemoths here. These are uh, 800 ton tools made by Korea. And the purpose of these tools is to make a quote, quote, sub-assembly in the, uh, of, the, of a vacuum vessel sector. So a vacuum vessel sector comes in with um, four of the made, well, representing 1 40th of the overall torus that is the, that is the tokamak. Um, so 40 degrees, uh, one, sorry, 1 ninth, uh, 40 degrees of that, of that uh, circle. Um, that means that nine of them will be made in total, four in Korea, uh, five in Italy. And the first one from Korea uh, has arrived. It is, uh, it is uh, uh, to be assembled here, held in sort of the belly of, of this overall tool. And then what you have is these external arms that can move with absolute precision along these tracks. So you, you uh, start with pieces of thermal shielding that are ultra, ultra thin and um, very uh, shiny. They're silver coated. They really look like a jewel. And, and the reason for that is because as a thermal shield, they are designed to give you not the full protection from you know, 150 million degrees inside and the cryogenics on the outside. But even though that's, that's, uh, we have the magnetic uh, cage that holds that in, there is, of course, a, a giant uh, temperature gradient. And so the thermal shield helps that. In addition, you have uh, two magnets, D-shaped magnets, added to each one of these uh, vacuum vessel sectors. So in combination, two pieces of thermal shield, two magnets, one vacuum vessel sector, you assemble all of this in these tools using various, this is a lifting tool. This will actually, uh, you, can, you can lay this down flat, put a magnet on it, and then gently, gently, gently raise it to the, to the position it is here so that the D-shaped magnet is actually held by this tool. Then the overhead cranes pick it up and they carefully transfer it to this tool so that these arms can sort of close like angel's wings and bring the two magnets together to a point where they are united with the vacuum vessel sector and can be welded in place. And that has to occur uh, nine times. So, uh, so that you get your, your, final, uh, your final piece. Now, here you see the tool um, from, we're going to the opposite end of the hall now. So this is where we were uh, before. And, and now you can see that you have in these tools, you see where, you, now, now you can see a bit more where this, this is the track where the arms will move and the belly of the first one, it's not very easy to see, but in here, you actually have the first vacuum vessel sector that arrived from Korea uh, last fall that is, um, that is actually, uh, I think it was, uh, it arrived in France, we celebrated on about 27th of July and then it arrived at the Eater site about the first week of August. So we've been working now to condition that. It's now in there. We've added elements of the thermal shield and the D-shaped magnets um, will, will, be, will be added uh, soon to, to that. So um, that's, that's really the assembly, uh, the assembly process. And then what happens is that it's taken from there and will be uh, lifted again. These overhead cranes run all the way from the assembly hall. This is the border into the tokamak building, right? So it will go all the way in and, uh, and down into the tokamak pit, which is a bit hard to see, but we'll be going into the tokamak pit uh, very directly. So that is your overall process. This is one more photo where you can see, here. this is the actual vacuum vessel sector. So now we're inside the, the giant tool that I was showing you. That is one ninth of the vacuum vessel. Inside, you can see quite a lot of sort of these these bosses that will have various diagnostic tools, uh, observation ports, every 
everything that you can imagine, every single way we can imagine to analyze the plasma as scientists. And here on the outside, you can see the shiny part. That is the very, very thin thermal shield. Now, there's an interesting story about the thermal shield. Um, there are, because of all of these first-of-a-kind components that are challenging you know, companies like, in this case, uh, uh, Hyundai uh, uh, Heavy Industries, uh, who made these, but the same could be said of General Atomics or, or Mitsubishi Heavy Industries or Rosatom or Larson and Tubro in India or various you know, Chinese or, or other, uh, every, every member has had their own major companies involved. But there are spin-off effects. So the European Union did a, did a calculation a while back um, looking at for every euro spent on ITER, what is the return to the economy? And there are obvious returns because their companies are getting the funding to make these, to make these components and so forth. But there are also, and, and of course there are jobs, there are, there are all of those, those normal things. But considering that the other members are not actually giving money to the European Union, they're contributing components, where is the real payoff? And a lot of that payoff comes in spinoff effects. So this thermal shield, to give you an example, after Korea perfected how to make something this large, this precise, this thin, and to have the silver coating across all of it, they realized that they had something that could also be used for their liquefied natural gas containers. Because when you're shipping LNG, liquefied natural gas, you have the same issue. You do not want to lose, you, you want a, a barrier between the temperature gradient that is the ambient air or what you, you know, the shipping uh, that you're doing and the super, super cool liquefied natural gas inside. You want to lose as little heat as possible for efficiency on that trip. And so they're now making, based on what they learned from ITER, they are making better, more efficient liquefied natural gas containers. That's just um, one, uh, one uh, aspect of that. I can imagine so many new technologies coming out of this project just because of the extreme needs and requirements for the engineering design and implementation, construction and assembly of various parts. It's, it's always like that, you know, the kind of spin-off technology that came out of the U.S. space program, you know, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I expect no less than, uh, than that sure. from either. It's true. And CERN, I mean, CERN does not have one might say it does not have a practical endpoint, at least not as concretely as what ITER does, but there have been many, many practical, practical applications, you know, from the World Wide Web to much else that has come out. So we're now going to go across here, and I, you can't even see it here, but we're going to go down into the tokamak pit that, um, that actually sits on the other side. Now, before we do that, in the tokamak complex, we're going to go into this building, but this is the tritium building. And you can see that because the tritium building is not so far, uh, it will not be used for first plasma because as I mentioned uh, a bit earlier, we will only use uh, regular hydrogen for first plasma. The tritium building is one of those elements that will be built out fully during the, um, during the post first plasma series of stages of, of build. Also, while I'm out here, I would mention there will be a control building, which is which is actually just, there's just groundworks under construction there. Here in the foreground, I mentioned that, uh, if you remember, this was the building sticking out from the assembly hall where we have the two heating systems. There is another heating system going in here, which is ma being made in Italy, as I mentioned, the neutral beam system. And then there is a, um, a hot cell uh, system. So in other words, a hot cell complex where the robots will deliver certain components that have been already radiated and exchange them out or do maintenance and take them back in. That will be in this construction area that right now is just a, just a staging area. So that will, that will all be going on. Now, we go, uh, the, the, just to illustrate the clean room, this is the tunnel we take to get from the assembly hall into the, uh, into the tokamak complex. And um, what you get then, this is the the top-down view of our, our uh, I don't know, what should we call it, cathedral um, <laughs> or, or coliseum. Um, sitting at the base of that coliseum um, are several components that we've talked about. This, to give you a sense of scale, that's the 10-meter magnet. Mm -hmm. All right, so that magnet is the first installed magnet. It's PF6. PF5, which will go up here on these supports 
is the one that you just saw in the assembly hall. Mm -hmm. That will be the next one going on. Then we'll have other supports and you will have another magnet that goes almost fully to the diameter of the, uh, th that one will be 17 meters. This one will be 24 meters, another 24 meters, and then a narrower one. And at the top, a small one that's, that's uh, being made about this size again, that's being made in, uh, in Russia, in St. Petersburg. So um, th that's the magnet system. Now I mentioned the cryostat base. You may find it hard to see. I'll show you another view in a moment, but right here, if you go around the parameter, this where you see these little lines, this at the bottom is the cryostat base. So it's both this platform and then a side coming up here and this platform extending out. That whole thing is the, is the base of the cryostat, the thermos that encircles everything. And then you'll notice that here you see concrete and here you see, you see steel, right? So that is because at the edge of the cryostat base, we added the lower cylinder, which is like the one I showed you outside stored in a cocoon, um, about the size uh, of, of Stonehenge, 10 meters high and you know, 30 meters in diameter. Well, this component, the, the first component, the base at 1,250 tons, and 30 meters across was laid down again by these overhead cranes, remember, mm -hmm. was laid down with a precision under three millimeters at every metrology point. Wow. So again, uh, somewhat insane uh, engineering. And when you get to then, the, this is a view where you can actually actually see, in fact, my, my cousin is an opera singer and my dream is to bring him and uh, a full quartet of, of uh, opera voices. <laughs> I don't know if we'll pull it off, but I would love to have them, you know, standing at these ports and uh, and giving me a full operatic rendition uh, here before we close this tokamak up. But um, we'll see if my dream becomes a reality. But here you can see the, the size of the magnet. Um, each one of these components, even if it looks quite simple, is uh, developed with extraordinary precision, even if it's, if, if it's purpose, is just to hold this, um, uh, this facility in place because the entire complex that we've been looking at is actually positioned here underneath on 400 and something seismic uh, pillars. Uh, when it was there, they, they look sort of like the, 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 um, the being in Xi'an in China with the terracotta warriors. You know, there are these warriors standing mm -hmm. under here. And we, it is possible to have seismic activity in Provence, but the real reason we're doing this is to be sure that we can position a full facility with that amount, you know, 23,000 tons, all of that weight that it can actually hold and, and remain on, on, uh, on point uh, without distortion uh, in a seismic event. Then in addition, the component that has now uh, arrived just as of a couple of weeks ago in Marseille, the first central solenoid module coming from uh, coming from France, uh, sorry, coming from San Diego from the U.S. The U.S.'s major contribution will be right here in the center, so aligned right along this center line. And in fact, what you have here is just a tool. Mm -hmm. um, you will, we will add tools that go all the way up because the central solenoid will not be installed immediately. So when we bring these sections of vacuum vessel and lower them here into the pit, they will be aligned all the way around vacuum vessel along with the D-shaped magnets coming round and round. And these will be supported simply during assembly by this tool. This is just a tool and it will have several more increments going all the way up. So the tool will hold everything in place, but then the central solenoid eventually will come in here. So now you will have a central aligned solenoid. You will have these ringed magnets going flat around the outside and the D-shaped magnets going around the, the torus in each, in each direction. That's how you get the combination of the three, uh, the three pieces of the magnetic field. Yeah, two weeks ago, I was reading uh, an article about the shipment of that piece from uh, San Diego and yeah. all, the, all the extreme measures they had to, they had to implement in order to uh, accommodate the weight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that is your, that is your uh, tour of the ITER facility. I hope that that was uh, also fun and enlightening. I, I hope that all of your, all of your listeners and, and Aliyar, you yourself will at some point 
uh, depending on COVID restrictions and hoping we get through this, that you'll be able to visit us uh, physically. We do give visitor tours. Those tours vary week to week because of what can or cannot be accessible in a, in a uh, you know, highly industrialized construction site, but we do our best to, uh, to give those tours in person. But I hope Absolutely. that this virtual tour helped you as well. That would be my dream to 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 visit that uh, that site. I have to make a confession here that you know wherever I'm traveling in Europe, you know when I'm going to Spain or Italy or Holland, I fly into Paris. Regardless of where I'm going, I fly into Paris and they drive in Europe. I love driving oh, in wow. Europe. Yeah. You know yeah. I've driven I've driven straight from uh, Maastricht for 28 hours to Cannes. I had. A conference I had a talk to give in Maastricht and then the next day I had a talk in Cannes and I drove 20 hours straight <laughs> and actually I barely arrived you know on time to walk you know park my car and park and walk on the stage and be able to give my talk that's how much I love France and love <laughs> Europe and the nature and the driving experience there I like it as I like it as well but it also labels you as having been corrupted by the American culture you know it's it's quite funny um, when, when my wife and I moved, I met my wife in Vienna and when we moved to, to New York, um, for her, the idea that, that we would actually be so insane as to drive to Florida um, <laughs> just, just seemed outrageous because in Europe, you know, the countries are much smaller. And so that kind of a drive, uh, it happens, but you certainly don't do it regularly. And, you know, six hours or 10 hours is considered quite a lengthy drive. So I, I understand. I fully share your sentiments about travel in Europe. I won't even tell you about my drive from New York to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're moving on. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit. I want you to talk a little bit about the, uh, the heart of the fusion reactor, which is a machine called Tokamak machine that, uh, that confines, as you explained you know, before, it confines a plasma using uh, using magnetic field. The magnetic field that's generated by those magnets that you just uh, that just demonstrated. So the plasma uh, is kept away from the vessel wall by a very strong magnetic field and magnetic coil that's placed around the vessel. I mean, the ultimate temperature of the plasma is brought to about 200 million, 300 million, as you said degree centigrade, you know, by the time you get that high, it doesn't really matter whether it's 200 million or 300 million, no form of matter can stay, you know, uh, in any condition, in any state other than plasma state. And you need that temperature to overcome the natural uh, electromagnetic repulsion between protons and cause collision to fuse the protons together uh, and release this enormous amount of energy that's, uh, that's really uh, hidden inside the inside these uh, protons. So, could you put some details on this picture and how uh, how you hope to achieve such extreme conditions? Sure. Um, if I may, I, I am going to use uh, an object for an object lesson for this. So, so um, on our website, we we realized it's at a certain point that that we had a lot of. Um, fans and it was it was uh, getting bigger and bigger around the world and we also really wanted to inspire young people. So I convinced some of my colleagues in Hungary at the at their center for uh, for nuclear research in Hungary and um, they or sorry it's Center for Energy Research. They came up they took the actual CAD drawings that we use which are um, extraordinarily heavy files and they dumbed them down a bit, a bit, a bit until they came up with files that could be 3D printed. So what, what I have that I will try to use to answer your question is actually a, a model here, a 3D model of the, of the tokamak. Mm -hmm. And it's all 3D printed. Um, we, we now have maker spaces and others around the world who are manufacturing, quote, their own tokamak so that they can follow us along in the assembly process. So here at the bottom is the, the base of this cryostat, the gray piece. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the 30 meters in diameter. This is exactly one one hundredth scale. So um, if I've got something here that's 30 centimeters, that means it's, it, it would be 30 meters. So at the very, very base, you can see um, if I don't drop anything out. Well, first of all, you see these round magnets, yes, right? So yes. This is the one being manufactured in, in, uh, in, Mos in uh, not Moscow, but St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. uh, the the um, next one is 17 meters. That's the one that is uh, in process that you saw in process 
being made in the long red striped building where we were making the big magnets. Mm -hmm. This is the next scale. These are 24 meters. And at the bottom inside, if, if you could tilt it without dropping everything out, you would see the the uh, the other magnets yes, that are yes. there inside. Yeah. Yes. So then in the vacuum vessel, you have these in, in what you see in blue here. This is the second set of, of magnets. This is the the D shaped magnets that I was referring to mm -hmm. these in mm -hmm. blue. So you have you have 18 of these nine made in Italy and nine made in Japan, uh, plus one extra. Actually, Japan's making 10. So we have a spare. But those are being made um, in in uh, those two countries. And then in the center, you have this, this uh, one that you read the article about, the central solenoid. Mm -hmm. Now, the central solenoid is being made in, in um, six modules because it, in total, uh, it's about 13 meters high. In fact, if you include all of the, all of the supports around, it's about 18 meters high. So you, you simply could not, uh, again, too big to ship. But General Atomics figured out a way to do it in a modular way. Mm -hmm. And so the first module, as you've been reading in the news, has, uh, has arrived in, in France. So how does that work? Well, basically these gray sections inside here are, are vacuum vessel sectors, uh, each one basically one, one ninth of the total. Mm -hmm. And what you were seeing on those big tools in the assembly hall, uh, this model does not show thermal shielding, but it shows this being held in the belly of the beast and then the two of these blue, uh, they're not blue, of course, but two of these D-shaped magnets being attached to it with the thermal shielding. So how does this actually now work in the, in the machine? Um, what essentially happens is that the, uh, to, to, to get to 150 million degrees, let me start with that. You're using, you're, you're using three overall heating systems. The first mm -hmm. one, you, you run a current through the, um, through the gas that you, you inject gas in. This is the, the uh, deuterium tritium gas forms of hydrogen. And you run a current and the current works just like uh, a fluorescent light bulb. It changes uh, the gas to the fourth state of matter plasma separating the electrons from the nuclei. So everything is in a free floating ionized uh, soup in a, in a light bulb that gives you fluorescent light. In this case, it will give you a plasma, an initiated plasma. Now, you, you then start heating by way of microwaves, uh, much like you might have in your, in your house, just a lot bigger and, and quite a lot of them. And those microwaves then are your second heating system. Your third heating system is then um, the one that will, that's being built to full scale in Italy that will be a uh, neutral beam. Uh, so it's, it's um, when I say a neutral beam, it is a, it is a beam of neutral uncharged particles coming in that will um, further heat the plasma as, uh, as we do say with, with you know, one billiard ball hitting another. And there are many, many molecular reactions, uh, atomic reactions where that, where that occurs. So the central solenoid pulses. That's the only magnet here that pulses. So I've used the illustration that this magnet, the most powerful magnet ever made, um, about a thousand tons with all six modules together, will be strong enough to pick up an aircraft carrier. Wow. These, 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 if you saw in the assembly hall where I showed you those big machines, these are each about the weight of a, of a Boeing 747. <laughs> okay, so that's what you're assembling here. Um, 23,000 tons in total. So you get the pulse coming from this one and that pulse then creates a helical, uh, you know how uh, uh, you, you will see uh, if you use magnetic filings, if you have a magnetic line and it's done with precision, yes. the filings will align themselves on that mm -hmm. line. That's what we're doing. All these charged particles in here are magnetic and they will align. This will create a circular helical um, uh, uh, pulse mm -hmm. that is going uh, back, a set of magnetic lines together with these uh, D-shaped magnets that are actually shaping and helping to further confine the, the plasma. Mm -hmm. But in combination, they will tend to push it away from the middle. And so you have these outer magnets that then keep it in shape. And in combination, this is how in combination you create this precise magnetic field that is precisely aligned to the, uh, to the shape of the vacuum vessel. If you take a cross section, you'll see that the, the magnetic cage really conforms. Mm -hmm. At the bottom here, um, this, this, these components are being uh, partly designed, they're different parts, but they're partly be des being designed in uh, in Russia, part in Europe, 
And what happens with these components, this is called the diverter. This will have the biggest heat load because as the helium uh, nuclei from the reaction, from the fusion reaction, continue to heat the plasma, as they lose that heat and energy, they, they drift to the bottom. So we mm -hmm. call it ash, even though it's nothing looking like ash, but that gives the highest heat load because they're, they're collected here in the diverter. Mm -hmm. So this is a tungsten coated monoblock because tungsten can withstand about 3000 degrees. And it, it's, it, that's what we will be, that's how we will be collecting. And these are modular so that hot cell facility that I was talking about, these will be able to re, re, be removed uh, one by one from the, uh, from the vacuum vessel. And you know, we, can, we can rotate them, they can move around a circle and, and move to take the helium ash out of the, of the vacuum vessel. So with, so, with all so, of those- So you're going from a temperature of 150 million, 300 million at the center of that D-shaped object to a temperature of, uh, I, I suppose you expect it to be a temperature of less than 3000 degrees centigrade so that it doesn't melt the tungsten diverter. Exactly, exactly, yeah. That's that's when it that's when it releases and and drops to the bottom. But it will that's that's from experience. That's the that's the point at which the the helium ash no longer becomes part of the actual. In other words, the helium is no longer heating, and it's it's lo lost enough heat that it is both tolerable to the tungsten and it is it is um, sinking to the. It's no longer interacting in the plasma, um, just just out of gravity. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so what you're what you're getting in that case is um, also we, we also have uh, two other control devices that I should mention. Um, one stationary, which is the, the Chinese, in addition to these three magnet systems, which is the only three we normally talk about, they are also making some small, meaning they're in the range of like 10 tons each, uh, correction coils. So you can slightly adjust uh, to further uh, make the make the uh, depending on, on what is, how you are tuning the, the magnetic field, you can do a little bit of tuning of that. In addition, um, the US is making, I mentioned when we were talking about jet, this pellet injection, um, the US is making a, a uh, pellet injector that can shoot a, a, uh, a solid pellet of, um, of fuel into the, into the machine. And that can help you to react very quickly to any kind of, uh, because you will, you will have, as you get a concentration in some area of the, of the plasma, a concentration of fusion events, you can have distortion. So you have to have, you know, uh, sub-micron second um, uh, ability to react very quickly and control that. That's how you're doing the ongoing continuous control, uh, which for which the, uh, we call it ELM, uh, uh, load mo uh, local, uh, electron load uh, modeling, which will uh, enable you to, to actually, um, it's a control system, enabling you to respond near instantaneously to any sort of concentrated fusion event that might distort your magnetic field mm -hmm. or challenge mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing. And, and you know, uh, I assume that, you know, all of this has, uh, been before you even uh, spend a penny all of this has been simulated by, uh, by probably a general contractor who uh, eventually has assured the decision makers about the implementation of this uh, project that such a thing is possible. I mean, that amazing temperature gradient at the center of that D-shaped magnet of you know, dropping from 150 million to about 3000 degrees centigrade, that, uh, that by itself, I mean, being able to reenact that in the real world is, uh, you know, it's uh, nothing less than really scientific miracle. And um, I really, I mean, the more I hear about this, the more, the more eager I get to, uh, to see it, you know, in fruition and, and someday, you know, visiting there when you actually um, uh, start up the, the magnet and start harnessing this power. So my next question is given that the use, uh, uh, to use the uh, fusion for power generation, it takes construction of a facility like ether. Uh, uh, one of the most, which is, I think, one of the most complex, if not the most complex scientific and engineering project in the world with a price tag, as you've mentioned, of uh, $20 billion to generate 500 megawatts of power, while the typical price tag of a thousand megawatt fission power plant is about $5 billion, you know, depending on who is manufacturing it. 
what justifies a technology that is, uh, you know, eight to 10 times more expensive than, uh, than uh, fusion reactor sp specifically, that uh, there are around 400 such uh, um, fusion power plants, I'm sorry, fission power plants in operation around the world. Now, if, if ITER is successful, uh, do you think that, you know, going from the prototype, which is ITER, to an actual power plant based on tokamak, the price reduction would be high enough to, to be able to compete with the, uh, with the uh, uh, fission reactors and other modes of energy generation? I would say yes, definitely. Um, it's a complex question and thanks because it's a, it's a very good one. Uh, what I would say, Aliyar, is that the, when, you, when you look at, uh, first of all, the, the um, solutions available to us for combating climate change, um, and you think about those in terms of carbon-free energy, uh, you know, maybe some transitional energy uh, uh, production with things like, like natural gas, because it's lower in its carbon emissions than coal. Uh, but if you look at many of the, of the technologies that will be discussed this December in Glasgow, when, when countries are coming together to discuss climate change and how do we get to net zero, to be honest, um, they, they tend to discount fusion as being a non-proven technology. But in reality, the massive scale up of, uh, of renewables, while we've gotten the price point down in terms of production, um, we have not figured out, most of those are being manufactured with, to be honest, with, with uh, Chinese coal. So in other words, the electricity that is used to power the facilities that make solar uh, photovoltaics and, and, uh, and, and turbines and so forth, um, must also be made from a carbon-free electricity generation or else you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot, uh, getting carbon-free by admitting more carbon. So um, that and the fact that the scale-up of, uh, while we've gotten the price down, which is admirable of, of renewables, the actual scale-up has not been tested in, in a realistic setting in, um, in anywhere in the world, in the sense that you take um, the concentration of humans moving to cities, and you take a large city, whether that's of the size of, you know, 2.8 million people in the St. Louis metropolitan area, or you scale all the way up to New York City or Mexico City or Tokyo or something like that. So um, we have not yet begun to confront the local community reaction to the unbelievable amount of land use that you start to have to sacrifice in the vicinity of those cities in order to blanket it with renewables. So when you come to, to a, 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 a fission plant, um, you have uh, selective acceptance. You know, there are very few countries right now that are actively building. There are some, but there are very few that are actively building uh, fission plants. And I don't know of any that are saying, we're going to use fission plants to replace all of not only the electricity that we have. In France, as, you, as I mentioned, we have more than 70% than of our electricity coming from, from fission. That's the highest percentage in the world. Uh, in the US, it's, it's around uh, probably just under 20%, maybe 15 or 20% of the electricity. But then you have all of that additional energy, which is, um, which is right now you know, for heating, for transportation, for agriculture, for many other uses. And that all has to have a clean end use as well, either electricity or, or hydrogen fuel cells so you're really talking about this massive, massive scale up. When we come to Glasgow, um, you will be hearing people talking about the solutions as scale up of, of, uh, of renewables, which I would argue is also not a fully tested, socially tested, technologically tested uh, phenomenon. Then you also have carbon capture and that's being touted as if it is a, a known a uh, phenomenon, a known science where in fact, you know, except for Norway being able to uh, so far store quite a lot of CO2 in an underground cavern that was really, you know, evacuate where they took already the natural gas and, and, and petroleum out and now they're restoring it and they're hoping that it holds up in terms of, you know, any seismic event and doesn't create a giant, uh, you know, methane burp to the, to the environment. Um, 
we have a lot of things that are not tested and we're going to need probably all of them. So now let's come back to your question about pricing, but I, I really want that background context. Europe is importing about $1 billion worth of petroleum products every day. So they are paying for an ITER equivalent every three weeks. The US is not, although the, the shift from Trump to Biden administration, we'll have to see exactly how the production or import or any other kind, you know, how, how the US plays out on the, <clears throat> as, an, as a net fossil fuel, uh, net oil exporter um, or, or not. You have to really see how that plays out. But within those numbers, um, we now come to the 20 billion spent on, uh, on ITER. And that is, um, that is total construction through first plasma. That's the number. In the way that I should first talk about the accuracy of that number, because in the way that um, I described each of ITER's member countries contributing components, not all of them publish their costs, and they're not required to. So you have the US and Europe that are publicly disclosing their budgetary figures for how much it costs. And we know that Europe is supplying about 45% of the machine, and US and all the rest are supplying about 9% of the machine. But those figures, those cost figures, are, are um, we know what they have spent. But that percentage was actually based on value, not actual expenditure. It, it was set you know, 12, 15 years ago as the, or 12 years ago when the, when the facility was, was being divided up. You, you make this component, you make this component. So we have, the 20 billion is an estimate based on what we know of Europe and what we can estimate about, in some cases, lower materials costs or labor costs in some of the other countries, China, India, Korea, Japan, et cetera, where they might have equal or lower uh, costs, but unpublished numbers. So that's an estimate. Um, I would argue that it is a much uh, more accurate estimate you will sometimes see um, uh, for people who are trying to disparage ITER that there was a Department of Energy estimate of 65 billion, which again shows you this you know, wide range, what is accurate. And that was actually based on the fact that the US um, uh, tends in project management to always produce a very, very high number for contingency. Whereas our, our Asian friends tend to build zero contingency into their budget. And it was an interesting international discussion. Do we or do we not use a contingency number? And uh, since we set the, the baseline of cost and schedule in 2016 here at ITER, we've not varied from it at all. The costs have stayed the same. So those predictions in the US of, of spending a lot more have not, have not come true. That's not to say with something like COVID, for example, that there would not be some, some cost escalation, but we don't think it will be that high. And, and those US numbers had, had been compounded and compounded and compounded to get to that $65 billion number. So I think 20 billion is a fairly accurate estimate. Now, consider that because we are an experimental machine, I showed you that giant diagnostics building, which is nearly half the size of the Tokamak building itself and packed with every conceivable form of equipment. That is not a commercial device. That is a research device that labels it as being something where you, you, I don't know exactly, but I would say in a commercial machine, once you've got the commercial design ready to go, you're probably going to have between 10 and 20% of that overall uh, 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 um, diagnostics, because this is a research device. So it, we, have, we, we, we expect, as, as I said before, to put 50 megawatts of heating into the, into the facility, uh, into the plasma for 500 megawatts out. But in reality, we are using three different types of redundant, somewhat redundant systems with much more heating capacity than that. Why? Not because we want to be inefficient, but because we're an experimental device. So we want to test which in combination with which makes your endpoint best. We're going to be testing different forms of tritium breeding. Um, we are using superconducting magnets now that must be cooled to 200 and minus 269 degrees even as tests and scale up is ongoing for a later superconductor that would only need to be uh, um, um, cooled to about minus 70 degrees. So you wouldn't need all of that cryogenics facility complex. So there are multiple aspects that would suggest that the actual cost, even if without efficiencies, just the actual cost of building an ITER-like device, an ITER-like commercial fusion device 
where you had a turbine generator, but you took away the, 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 the cooling systems. I mean, you, you substituted part of that because that's what the, the turbine generator would really do. And you took out some of these extras that are built in. And then you benefited from all of the knowledge that right now is being is going into making these things. As, as we talked, uh, the, these major companies are building first of a kind components they did not know how to build. Nobody had ever built something to that scale and precision. Now that we know all of those design and research and you know, all, all of that R&D aspect is vested in ITER. And while you will continue to have R&D, um, there's, there's no reason to assume that the costs, that the capital costs of a fusion device, a, a fusion power plant, commercial power plant, would be any more than that of a, of a, uh, of a uh, nuclear fission device. In fact, because of the safety aspects, you don't have, and the lack of moving parts. I mean, we're, we're shooting pellets in and the, the gas is moving, but you, know, you don't have pumps and uh, there, there, are, there are cryogenic pumps, but the magnets are staying in one place. You don't want them moving. You, you, it, so, so that means that maintenance, it means that longevity, all of those factors are generally uh, expected to be better for a tokamak than for a fission device, with the exception of what is the right material to use on the first wall, the primary wall that gets impacted, because that uh, could suffer neutron embrittlement and need, need you know, to be replaced. So there are many uh, R&D projects going on. Should we use a liquid wall? Should we use a differently configured wall, et cetera? Now, when you come to the, to the uh, the kilowatts, you know, everybody wants to know what's the kilowatts per hour. I can't give you a good number. I think it will be competitive. I think likely the fusion plants of the future will be, um, will be uh, the cost will be uh, similar to fission in the sense, large capital cost, relatively low operating costs, lower regulatory oversight costs because the safety is, is much, much greater. And, um, and uh, the, um, Overall operating and maintenance costs should be quite simple, and the fuel costs are almost nil. Your fuel costs are, are quite negligible. But there are two more factors to consider. One is um, if you if you think in terms of the uh, the the uh, the areas of science and engineering that could be the most impactive on this question. What could change that, that outlay? One of them is, as we study a burning plasma, and even a plasma where it gets more heating, you, you get to something called ignition, where all of your heating is coming from, uh, from the uh, fusion reaction itself, no external heating at all. So you're starting it, but like it, once you're starting it, you're not pressing the key for continuous, you know, continuous heating. You kick it off, and then you just run with ignition. Um, so all you're doing then is just putting in uh, fuel, but other than that, it is a self-sustaining, a fully self-sustaining reaction. Um, that will bring down costs if we know how to optimize, because your heating system cost then uh, uh, comes away quite a lot. Secondly, um, the the areas like uh, advanced manufacturing, um, there is much much more uh, now than even five years ago about the ability to 3D print in bi and tri-metallic um, uh, composites where you're not doing it from a powder, but from almost like welding. So it's got tremendous ductility and you know, all, of your, all of your metallic uh, metallurgy, all of your measurements there, the ability to, to uh, build things without welding, et cetera. So fabrication, advanced manufacturing and fabrication could have a big impact. Material science. Uh, which is again a field that's just racing. That that could have a big impact. Those would be the considerations that will be an influence on the answer to your question by the time we're ready to build commercial plants. The last aspect is one we don't talk about very much. But if you were to ask, what is the cost of that the nations of the world or just the U.S. in the last 20 years or 50 years or 150 years? that we have put into conflict, wars, alliances, um, in order to secure access to petroleum resources. How much has that cost us? Not just in, in, in dollars, 
but in geopolitical alliances and in uh, the resultant wars and the resultant aid and so forth. Imagine if every country on the planet had equal access, not only to the sun and the wind to fuel their renewables, but also to their concentrated baseload power plants, the fuel for that, which is completely abundant deuterium and lithium to breed tritium. Imagine what that geopolitical scenario could look like and how much economically that could make, that, that, the economic impact of that is, is incalculable. Not to say that, that I believe blissfully that humans will reach a point where there will be no conflicts, but in the, in the sense of positioning for petroleum, um, you know, both what we can define factually and what we suspect have been the motivations of various conflicts, um, that's a huge, huge economic uh, aspect to be considered. Now, lastly, for when will, the, you know, when will we get to commercial fusion? There are um, as many different roadmaps uh, to, with timelines to fusion power as we have members in ITER. So if you look at the Eurofusion uh, roadmap, the European Union, they are tending to be, uh, so far, logical and, and sort of, um, I would not say plotting, but conservative in, in sequential steps. Once ITER gets to full fusion power in 2035, we will begin finalizing the design of DEMO, which is a machine that would follow. If it uses all the same technology, which it will not, um, it would need to be correspondingly bigger because they would want a bigger queue, a bigger uh, uh, output versus input factor. And that would be your first uh, uh, machine driving electricity to the grid. So if you estimate that you start uh, construction in 2040 and you finish it in 2055, then your first generation of commercial machines is probably in the 2070s. If you look at the extreme other end, you have China building the uh, China Fusion em em Experimental Tokamak Reactor. I think it's something like that, CFETR. I may, I may not have the acronym exactly right, but China is already has, has completed the conceptual design and is, is working on the engineering design for building uh, a machine that is only slightly different than ITER. And their intention is that as soon as we hit first plasma, which is now scheduled for 2025, but as, as I mentioned, there's an ongoing evaluation of COVID impacts, it might be 2026. But in any case, once that's done, and we demonstrate general machine functionality, China will take all the intellectual uh, uh, property that they have managed and that others have managed and try to work together to build an ITER-like machine with a phase two. So they get all of that knowledge and with, with a phase two, um, connect that to the grid. And they would want that connected to the grid by 2040. Um, can they do it? It's really challenging, you know, who knows? But Boris Johnson, uh, announced uh, a little while back, I don't know exactly the date, that the UK would be uh, trying to build a fusion pilot plant, uh, which means trying to, trying to produce you know, electricity to the grid by 2035 or 2040. The US National Academies, uh, the, first of all, the FESAC, which is DOE's, the Department of Energy has something called the Fusion Energy um, Science Advisory Committee, FESAC. And they had come up, they came out with a report in, I think, February of this year and about the same time, really very close to the same time, a long-term study that had involved private sector and academia and government came out with a report through the National Academies uh, in the US, again, saying, looking for a 2035 to 2040 uh, build of a pilot plant in the US. Now, those, those pilot plants, would have the advantage of ITER's, uh, ITER's scale-up, the, the, the intellectual property we're gaining right now, how to scale up technology. They would also have, if, if MIT, uh, MIT has a spin-off, uh, a spin-out company called um, Commonwealth Fusion, um, which is building something called Spark. And Spark is a uh, machine that's much like ITER, it is more spherical, where ours is a bit more D-shaped. The, the donut is a little distended in ITER. And um, 
they are using these high temperature yttrium based superconductors. Uh, the same is true of Tokamak Energy, a private company in the US. Um, the Fusion Industry Association in the US is, a, is focused on private sector enterprises. And they have 17, 20, something like that, private sector enterprises trying to beat all of ITER's predictions and come out with something faster. Some of those are based on, uh, all of them are based on, on sound engineering and science, but some of that engineering and science is much, much less tested than the ITER style tokamak. Some of it has new features like the different types of magnets. Um, in one case, General Fusion in Vancouver has built successively larger machines and now has gotten permission from the UK government to build their next machine in the UK. Their device is utterly strange. It, it takes um, similarly a plasma, but it has coordinated pistons around a sphere that compress and, and get, your, get, get you to the appropriate uh, temperature and, and, and pressure and fusion events in a concentrated pressure way um, uh, in a, what has to be absolutely infinitely precisely timed. So everybody's got their own challenges and, and some, you know, we hear rumors of Lockheed Martin wanting to build a fusion device that'll fit on the back of the truck. We know that Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos have all invested in one way or another in fusion, commercial fusion enterprises. And some of them have very, very aggressive timelines. When you have the discussion between an ITER set of scientists and those folks, we used to hear a lot of sort of poo-pooing of each other's ideas or that'll never work or you guys are taking too long or whatever else. And the truth is that <clears throat> a lot of that sort of competitive discussion has died down because we're all in this race together. All of us have got exactly the same endpoint. We want to create the ability for human society to tap in to replicating the suns that are the energy of the sun and the stars so that our kids get a better legacy than the one we inherited and the one we contributed to. Very well said. Uh, actually, you already answered my last question, which was about the commercialization and the feasibility of, uh, of whatever design comes out of uh, ITER and, and all the other competitive uh, models and competitive designs that you alluded on. Uh, I think the model that uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are investing on is called a Stellatron or something like that, that, you know, it's a, basically a different engineering de design for the, for the plasma confinement. And uh, whatever it is, you know, I think these kind of competitions are healthy and we should not discourage each other, but you know, feed from each other's energy to have more conviction about the, especially the multinational nature of such a project. I think if I'm not mistaken, you know, this is probably the largest international uh, uh, cooperation among nations who are otherwise, you know, always competing in on military grounds, on nuclear technology development, on economic grounds, and and this is a very healthy environment that you have created. And you know, one of the least advantages that you know such a project can have is the the spirit of cooperation among nations and uh, and uh, contribution to the peace, and and especially comparing it with the other technology, with the fission technology that easily lends itself to miniaturization and the development of nuclear bombs, and the delivery and all of that, the fission technology does not because of the sheer enormity and the complication, it will never lend itself to uh, to unpeaceful uses, and that is another reason that you know such a technology should be supported and you know the entire everybody who hears about it should be very excited about it and uh, and uh, in that regard you are uh, you're really contributing to peace and uh, and a better life on this planet by simply you know adv advocating this and disseminating information about it and uh, uh, for our little part uh, for your uh, you know preparedness and and help and kindness and generosity of spending two more than two and a half hours with us uh, explaining everything. I thank you very much. And I thank everybody who is involved, you know, all the unseen friends who are working tirelessly for all these years to make this a successful project. I, you know, I, on behalf of the entire humanity, I thank them and I wish them the best of luck and excitement and success in every aspect of life, including the success for this project. And uh, if you have any concluding remarks, uh, uh, Laban, I, I'll, I'll be able to uh, give you a few more minutes before, uh, before we close the interview. 
Yes, well, and, and thank you, Aliyar, for, for giving me this, this platform. Um, I look forward to hearing from you at some point about the feedback of, of your listeners. Um, I'm happy to give you the time. I, I, I think that one of our big missions uh, specific to communication has been simply to raise awareness. Um, we want to educate young people. We want to inspire people about this. Uh, we want honesty and transparency in terms of both the challenges and the costs, but also the benefits and what it could really mean. And you have uh, much more than many of the people that interview me, you have very wisely highlighted the, the aspects of science diplomacy and the benefits of countries coming together in ways that, that can produce a, uh, not only an energy legacy, but also can help us to think about collaborating in very practical terms, pooling our knowledge and expertise on these massive challenges. And you know, there's this there's this old biblical legend, the story of the of the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. and and the way in which um, humans have have um, at that time tried to come to together to build the the characteristic Middle Eastern ziggurat to get to the you know to reach the stars. And, and the folly of grandiose human ambition. And I think of that story quite often because the legend has it that, that God then dispersed them. Um, and up to that point, they could all speak the same language and they lost that ability. And they were dispersed you know, around, around the planet then in, in multiple languages for the folly of their, of their hubris and their pride. And in a certain way, I think, that's very characteristic of the of the human animal, where where we have um, maybe not all of us have felt that we're engaged in these grandiose ventures, but in a certain way we are because we have we have become a species that has has the challenge of whether we will be the engineers of our own destruction, and so no matter what energy device we come up with. Um, any future that we can envision, no matter how, how wonderful, will also be dependent on how we can evolve as humans in how we relate to each other. And while with ITER, you could look at it like a reverse Tower of Babel in the sense of, of the, you know, maybe math or CAD computing, uh, design computing, you know, becoming our common language that we can reach and, and ensure that we can make things all over the world that come here and fit together into a single experimental device that will shape our future. The heart of what we're doing is exactly what you have said. The heart of what we are doing is learning how to get along with each other toward a common goal. And in the end, um, that will, in my view, be an equally important legacy from, from this project. Can we learn to do that? And then not only learn, in the cause of doing something that now I go back home and build my own fusion, fusion tokamaks, but can I learn that, wow, that cooperation made us more than the sum of our parts. And in that, in that type of collaboration, we have a chance of answering that question, you know, are we going to be the architects of our own self-destruction um, with a no? And, or answering it in a positive way, can we in fact collaborate in a way that we recognize that we are united in what we want to pass to our children. And I think, I think the answer will be a resounding yes. So that would be my closure. And that would be uh, my, uh, my wish that, 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 that is that probably the, the single most important thing for your, for your listeners to take away. And thank you. Thank you very much, Laban. It was a pleasure talking to you. It was a huge learning experience for me. And I'm sure it would be the same for our audience. And with that, I thank you and all the people who've been involved in, in ITER and goodbye. And I wish you the best of luck in, in the successful implementation of ITER. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.